In this video, I'm going to make dry ice from scratch, starting with the chemical reaction between hydrochloric acid and baking soda to make CO2 gas. I was curious to see if I could get closer to liquid nitrogen temperatures with my pulse tube cryo cooler by pre-cooling with dry ice, because the ice is minus 79 C and I can produce a temperature drop below ambient of almost 100 C, so if I could start at minus 79 and drop 100 degrees, that would put me at a low enough temperature that I could liquefy nitrogen if I increase the pressure to about 6 atmospheres. Of course, I could just buy dry ice from the store, but I thought this was a good opportunity to try a little thermochemistry, so I looked into what it would take to make it. For a start, Obviously, I'm going to need some CO2 gas, and there's a variety of ways to produce or capture it. Here's a few examples. Method 1. Cooling off and collecting the exhaust from hydrocarbon combustion. Simple in theory, but kind of a pain in practice, and you're still paying for the fuel. Method 2. Letting yeast consume sugar in a closed container and collecting the exhaust from the digestion, which is CO2 gas. Method 3. Capturing CO2 from human breath. An adult exhales about a kilo of CO2 per day on average. This is basically a freebie, but the only tricky part is convincing somebody to wear a mask all day, which you'd never be a- nah, actually, never mind. Method 4. Dissolving atmospheric CO2 in water. A liter of water can hold about a liter of dissolved CO2 gas at room temperature. Once the gas is dissolved, it could easily be removed by pulling a vacuum on the water. The only problem here is it requires a massive volume of air to be bubbled through a given amount of water because of the extremely low concentration of CO2 in the air. Method 5. Passing atmospheric air over a bed of calcium hydroxide. When the calcium hydroxide reacts with the CO2 gas in the air, it forms calcium carbonate, which can then be heated to release CO2 gas and calcium oxide. When the calcium oxide is reacted with water, it turns back into calcium hydroxide and can be used again. Method 6. Acid and baking soda. This is a very familiar reaction that we see in the volcanoes little kids make for science fairs, where the acid is very dilute acetic acid, aka vinegar. This is the method I'm going to use because baking soda is dirt cheap and I already have a large quantity of hydrochloric acid for pool maintenance. In my case though, the acid is 31% concentration, so I'll have to be very careful handling it. Okay, let's get set up. I've got this 1 liter Erlenmeyer flask and I modified the plug to have an outlet port and a feed tube with a check valve to prevent backflow of the acid when pressure builds up from the reaction. Next, we're going to want to scrub the output because there's probably going to be a little bit of acid fumes and salt spray that we don't want to get into our gas, so this modified soda bottle will serve as a bubbler to clear things up. So far, so good. Now, the only problem with the bubbler is it makes the output gas very humid, so I use another soda bottle filled with silica gel desiccant as a dryer column. The only catch with the desiccant is that it can let off fine dust sometimes, so I attach a filter in line with the output of the dryer. Now we should be set up to have clean, dry CO2 gas coming out of this basic reactor I've set up. Let's give it a try. As you can see, when the flask gets a squirt of acid, it immediately causes the baking soda to fizz and the scrubber to bubble as CO2 gas is released. Looks like it's working and I don't see any sign of leakage. To collect the CO2 gas, I've got this 24 inch beach ball. These come evacuated right out of the package, so I don't have to worry about sucking all the air out to avoid impurities. With a little bit of force, a standard barb fitting can be pushed into the inflation valve of the beach ball, and now we've got our gas bag. As the reaction progresses, I can see the ball start to fill. At full inflation, the beach ball has a diameter of 24 inches, which equates to roughly 120 liters of volume, which is about 215 grams of CO2 gas. As you can see from the color change in the desiccant, there's quite a bit of moisture being removed from the gas stream. We want to minimize moisture because when we get down to dry ice temperatures, it'll instantly freeze and cause blockage in valves and pipes. Another interesting thing about this reaction is that it's actually endothermic, meaning it takes energy from its surroundings, resulting in a temperature drop. This is convenient because it means I don't have to worry about plastic or rubber parts melting from excessive heat, as would be the case with so many other chemical reactions. Just to prove to you this is actually CO2, let's set something on fire and try to extinguish it with the gas I just collected. This wad of paper towel has no problem burning in the glass. But now, I'll fill the glass with CO2 I collected. CO2 is about 50% heavier than air, so without any major disturbance it'll just sit in the glass. Let's try putting the wad of burning paper in the cup now instantly extinguished. How about if I set some rubbing alcohol on fire in the glass? Yep, still no problem putting out the fire. Let's try a slightly bigger fire.
That one took a second to put out, but the CO2 definitely still stopped it dead in its tracks. So now that we've seen how to make and collect CO2 gas, we need to store it somewhere. I need to fill four or five of these beach balls to get the quantity of gas I need, and I really don't feel like having a bunch of big inflated beach balls sitting around my workspace, so I'm going to use a regular old air tank to hold the gas under pressure. Let's throw some fittings together and rig up some hoses. Before I put the CO2 gas in, I need to evacuate all the air out of the tank so that I don't have any impurities. Once that's done, we'll hook up the beach ball and let the CO2 gas flow in from the vacuum on the tank. Once the tank is at one atmosphere, I'll connect the beach ball to the suction port of a fridge compressor and connect the discharge port to the tank. It takes quite a while with the little compressor, but I managed to get all the collected CO2 gas into the air tank. It tops out at just over 160 psi, or about 12 bar. This is a 10 gallon or 38 liter tank, so I'm storing about 810 grams of CO2. Alright, so now we've got a good quantity of carbon dioxide gas bottled up, but it's nowhere near the pressure needed. If we're gonna do everything at room temperature, the CO2 has to be put under enough pressure that it condenses into a liquid. Once it's a liquid under pressure, it's expanded out to one atmosphere, and the sudden pressure drop causes it to flash freeze to dry ice. To figure out the pressure we need, we need to look at a vapor pressure curve. For a fixed temperature, once we exceed the pressure on the curve, the gas will release a bunch of energy and spontaneously start to condense into a liquid. At room temperature around 25C, we'll need about 1000 psi for the gas to condense to a liquid. Seems kinda high, so let's see if my fridge compressor is up to the task. Surprisingly, the compressor nearly reaches 1000 psi, but the next time I try to start it, I get a nasty spark and then nothing happens after that. I think I shorted a winding in the motor by trying to run at such a high pressure. I've got another compressor, but it's a much smaller unit from a mini fridge and looks like it barely touches 500 psi. It's also very, very slow. We can actually still make this work, but it's going to require a lower temperature. If I put the high pressure tank in an ice bath while I'm filling it, I can drop the temperature down to 0C, and if we look at the vapor pressure curve again, 0C calls for about 35 bar of pressure to condense CO2, which is right at 500 psi. I think I can still pull this off. Just out of curiosity, I cut open the failed compressor to see what we had broken, and while the surgery didn't really shed much light on the problem, it did provide an interesting look at what's under the hood of one of these hermetic compressors. Here's the whole compressor removed from the casing. Nothing about the valve really seems damaged or broken though. The motor looks fine too, and the crank turns over pretty smoothly. Something is definitely shorted though, as you can see from the windings starting to smoke after I plug the thing in. Oh well, I guess we'll just let it burn. Alright, back to the matter at hand. I got this paintball tank, which is made specifically for the high pressures of liquid CO2. The capacity is 20 ounces, which translates to about 560 grams of liquid CO2. At 25C, this would occupy about 790 cc. Since the tank manufacturer didn't actually provide an exact internal volume, I weighed the tank empty and filled it up to the brim with fresh water, and the difference in weight gave me exactly 800 cc. Next, I drilled out the poppet and spring inside the valve, and tapped it for a 1 8 NPT so I could start connecting standard fittings to it. Just so you know, this is a very, very bad idea, and I don't recommend that anybody else do this, because if one of these fittings popped off at 1000 psi, it could easily be lethal. Anyway, I soldered up the joints to ensure a good seal, and added a pressure gauge and a flare fitting for a fill hose, then installed everything back onto the tank. Let's weigh everything before we begin. 1,235 grams empty. Let's remember that number for later. Now we'll hook everything up. For starters, I hook the high pressure cylinder directly to the large air tank and equalize the pressure. After that, I disconnect the high pressure cylinder and put it in an ice bath to get it down to zero C. Then I hook up my compressor between the large tank and the high pressure cylinder. I'm feeding the pressure from the large tank into the suction side of my compressor to give it a little extra boost so that it has the pressure it needs to condense the CO2. 
Judging by the noise and the heat, the little compressor really doesn't like to operate this way, but it did work. After about an hour, I estimated that the high pressure cylinder was full based on the pressure drop from the air tank. Let's take it out of the ice bath and weigh it again. Looks like we've gained about 488 grams or just over a pound. Not 100% full, but pretty damn close and all the CO2 in there is definitely liquid at this point. An important detail to remember here is that I don't have a siphon tube like a fire extinguisher or a commercial CO2 tank, so if I discharge the tank right side up, it's going to discharge the gaseous portion, which won't really produce any dry ice. Luckily the fix is very easy. The tank just needs to be turned upside down. Immediately a thick white stream comes out of the valve. That's liquid CO2 flash freezing to ice as it hits the atmosphere. After a moment, we start to form a little bead of dry ice on the ground that looks like a tiny mountain range. At this point, I'd say the project is a success, since I've made dry ice from scratch. But considering I had almost half a kilo of liquid CO2, that seems like a relatively small yield. Maybe we can increase the output with a collection device. After another day of producing and compressing CO2, I was ready for another attempt. The collector needs to catch all the liquid CO2, but also has to be porous enough that it can equalize to atmospheric pressure because the low pressure is what causes the liquid to freeze to ice. A sock seems to meet those requirements pretty well. The sock definitely collected more ice, but it came out in a very fine crumbly powder form which will evaporate quickly because of the large surface area. A lot of the ice tended to stick to the fibers of the sock, making it very difficult to extract. The stuck dry ice then caused atmospheric moisture to freeze onto the sock and turn it rigid, making it the newest addition to my crusty sock collection. After yet another painful afternoon of going through the tedious routine of producing and then compressing the CO2, I was ready for a third attempt. This time I'd be using a mold shaped like two halves of a cylinder clamped together. The mold had vent holes and a loose fit to allow pressure to vent, but the gaps were small enough that it should be capturing most of the ice. So let's give it a try. The result was less impressive than I was expecting. I think the flow rate was too high and the ice that would have otherwise been captured just got ejected through the gaps. I also messed up by holding the cylinder sideways which meant I wasn't getting all liquid coming out of the valve, a lot of it was actually gas. At least the ice chunks still made a cool smoke effect when I dunked them in the hot water. And as it turns out, I still had some leftover CO2 in the tank because the valve seemed to be clogged, so I went ahead and just discharged the rest of it into the water. The water that splashed onto the tank was immediately flash frozen and caused quite an impressive ice buildup. So making dry ice from scratch is definitely doable without complicated machinery, but between the cost of the reagents and the time required to cool and compress the CO2 gas, this definitely isn't practical for pre-cooling my cryocooler. 
If you had a large source of CO2 gas readily available and only had to do the compression portion, it might be another story. But for the moment, I think the most practical way to get pre-cooling down to dry ice temperatures would just be to use a vapor compression refrigeration system. Anyway, hope you found that interesting. Thanks for watching.